everybody. Welcome to BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. I'm Nikki. I'm Kelly. And I'm Tilly. This week, we'll be talking about Children of Blood and Bone by Tommy Ediemi. Some discussion trigger warnings, as this is a dark fantasy book full of graphic violence, racial oppression, hate crimes, grief, and revenge. And Tilly is going to read the synopsis for us. Zaley Adebola remembers when the soil of Arisha hummed with magic. Burners ignited flames, tiders beckoned waves, and Zaley's reaper mother summoned forth souls. But everything changed the night magic disappeared. Under the orders of a ruthless king, magi were killed, leaving Zaley without a mother and her people without hope. Now Zaley has one chance to bring back magic and strike against the monarchy. With the help of a rogue princess, Zaley must outwit and outrun the crown prince, who is hell-bent on eradicating magic for good. Danger lurks in Arisha, where snow lepanairs prowl and vengeful spirits wait in the waters. Yet the greatest danger may be Zaley herself, as she struggles to control her powers and her growing feelings for an enemy. Now, Kelly is going to introduce the drink that we've chosen to pair with this episode. Yes, I am so excited to try this drink because it looks super tasty and I had never heard of it before. So we chose this drink because the author is Nigerian-American and also because the book is set in a fantasy world inspired by Nigeria. So we chose a recipe for Nigerian Chapman Punch. This is a holiday drink with vodka, orange soda, Sprite, grenadine, and Angostura bitters with orange, lime, and cucumber slices. So if we're all ready, let's try this fruity cocktail. Can't wait. Here we go. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Mmm. Bubbly. That's so good. It is so good. It's so yummy. I actually added a few mint leaves on top of mine for a garnish because that was also a suggestion. And it's so lovely. Aw, I feel like it's going to be a staple drink. That's a good summer drink. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tropical. It's funny that they said it's a holiday drink because it does feel very like I'm sitting outside and it's warm. Well, I I guess in Nigeria, you are sitting outside and it's warm all the time, (laughs) so... Excellent point. Taken. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Um, Great. So now that we have our drinks with us, we're going to start talking about our ratings for this book, which I'm very excited to get into to hear your two opinions about this. Um, Just before we get into it, we rate this based out of five stars purely because that's kind of how Goodreads does it. We all have different reasons for why we give it the ratings that we do, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we say what our ratings are. Tilly, do you want to go first? I don't know, because I know that we're going to disagree. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we can sandwich you in between Kelly and I if you want. (laughs) Great, let's do that. (laughs) Kelly, take it away. (laughs) Okay, so... I am just going to be fully honest. I hated reading this book. I gave it a one out of five and I'm still going between, is it a 0.5 or a one? I went in this so excited to read it and I heard a lot of great things about it. I think it won a bunch of awards, which like great, good for you. Um, I read it and I, I really didn't enjoy it. I really wanted to DNF this book at about 20%. Um, I just felt like it had a lot of good ideas, but when I went to read it, it felt like it was an outline for a book or like a very early draft because I just, I didn't feel like it was flushed out at all. Um, yeah, I didn't care about the characters. I tried to care about the characters. It took me three weeks to read this book. I read the ebook, which is just under 500 pages, and by the end of it, or near the end of it, I was like so desperate to finish it so that we could record this, that I got the audiobook, which is just under 18 hours. 18 hours. And I sped it up to two times the speed and read the ebook at the same time so I could get to the end of this book. I have my reasonings and all that stuff, but I don't want to give spoilers away, so I'll just end it with that. Great. Wow. Tilly. Let's hear your thoughts. I mean, this is so surprising to me because, um, well, just buckle in, folks, because we're (laughs) going to have a disagreement about this book. (laughs) I loved it. I thought it was a terrific book. It had a lot of YA fantasy elements that really worked for me. I thought the world building was phenomenal. 
and especially exciting because the world is in a non-Western fantasy setting, um, which is not something that you get to see a lot, so I really love that aspect. I thought it had a well-crafted and compelling story with a lot of emotional stakes that all kind of worked for me, so it's it's surprising to hear that it didn't for you, but it is very personal. I also thought that there was a really great magic system that was complex and detailed, and I thought it was explained decently well, and I thought the plot was fast-driven and um, it was or fast-paced, and it was driven by characters with a decent amount of relatability. Now, I'm not going to say that um, it was a perfect book, and we'll get into kind of the discussion. But all that being said, I read I read it really fast. I read it in about three days, and Ooh. I couldn't wait to pick it up again. So um, I gave it a four out of five. I think it's probably actually closer to like a, it's waffling for me between like a 3.5 and a four because I really, really loved it in the beginning and I was so excited for it. I did find it dragged a bit. I did find it long, but overall, I was really happy with the experience reading the book. Awesome. I think it's also worth noting that this book was on the New York Times bestseller list for over 100 weeks. So oh, wow. um, Kelly and I are probably in the minority <laughs> with our opinions on it. But that being said, and this will be surprising when I get to my rating, but I was the person who suggested we read this book for the podcast. <laughs> Last year, I started reading it when I was on tour didn't get to finish it, and then a few months later decided I was going to continue reading and um, listen to the audiobook because I wanted to finish it, and I gave it a two out of five stars, but suggested it for the podcast because I felt like it was going to be a good read the second time I read it, because even though I gave it a two out of five, there was a part of me that really wanted to read the sequel and I felt like mm -hmm. there was something in there that I really connected with that was driving me to read more. Now, <laughs> I started reading the book for this podcast, got 20 pages in, and DNF'd it because oh. I couldn't make myself waste more of my life on oh this my book. <laughs> I, had, I listened to that... 18 hour audiobook and read and you know read the book before and I just couldn't do it to myself again. I knew that I wasn't going to make it through. <laughs> so so I, I this yeah. is so wild to me. I think this is the first time we've each kind of differed so greatly yeah. Yeah. in between. I guess in Addie LaRue too, I know that Nikki really disliked it and I think there were we were kind of like at different levels with that because yeah. Kelly really loved it. I was like, no, I really hate this. And you kind of, you had elements that you really loved and then things that really bothered you. So it kind of, mm -hmm. it was like a tier, like kind of scale yeah. a little bit. So yeah. I gave, I gave the book a one out of five because I DNF'd it the second time. But yeah, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm, I'm genuinely very interested in the things that you liked about it, Tilly. Because well, yeah. I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So I, <laughs> while I, I don't like it, I don't have necessarily very like strong feelings about why I didn't like it. It's I don't think this is gonna end in like fisticuffs or anything about <laughs> the ratings of this book. I hope but... it doesn't for me either. I just. <laughs> I still love you, Tilly. I just don't like this book. Oh, no, I know. I'm not offended. And honestly, like, I, I'm i just interested in the fact that um, some of us had different, such different experiences with it. Mm -hmm. Because I find in a lot of the other books that we've read, we've all kind of picked up on the same themes or the, th the same um, elements that we enjoyed. And so it's just so interesting to me that we had such completely different experiences. I'm, I'm not mad about it. I'm not going to fight anyone. <laughs> Um, but I will fight for this book because I really loved it. <laughs> Do we want to get into some like first impressions about what we think, I guess? Yeah, I'll start because I, I think I started reading it before you two. So because I messaged you both saying like, what age group is this written for? Because I knew it was a young adult, but I remember messaging you both saying, what age is this for? Because I thought it was written for a younger audience when I was reading it. And the reason why I said that was because I felt like there were no details given. So I was like, is this supposed to be like middle grade or like just at the cusp of YA? Because it just didn't feel mature in terms of like 
the the reading level, I guess, is the best way I could put it. Because I don't need, like, dense Grapes of Wrath crap. Like, we all know I'm not interested in that. But I just felt like I wasn't, I didn't have any info about how does this magic actually work? What are all these mm. things? Like, I don't know. Even just describing the environment that they were in, I was like, okay, so we know that they're in a marketplace. It sounds like every other marketplace I've ever heard of. Why is this special? Like, I don't understand. So, yeah, I just, I, I was so excited to read this book, too. It sounded so cool. And it, I'm like, I am all for a badass girl being like, I've got some dangerous magic. You know, there's going to be hell to pay. I am all in for that any day of the week. I just, I, I don't know. I just felt like there was not enough detail for me. And I was getting so confused at the beginning as to like, what are they training for at the beginning with the staffs? Who is, who is Mama Agba? Like, what is this? I just, <laughs> I don't know. I was, I thought it was written for a younger audience. Wow. C completely opposite reaction. <laughs> and it's possible too, because I know, um, we've talked before where I've read a lot of more kind of classic fantasy mm -hmm. than maybe either of you. I mean, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about that. I, but I did feel like this book had um, a similar pacing style to a more kind of like high fantasy giant book where there's a lot to get through at the beginning. Yikes. And so <laughs> I hear you that there weren't as many details right at the start, but I think it's because there was so much setup for the world and the society that we lived in. I didn't in the get book. any setup though. That's what I'm, that's what I mean. I'm like, I didn't get any, it was just like, okay, we're here doing this. And I'll tell you about my mother died and was killed by these people. And I understand that they're trying to be like, oh, we're racist against the Orisha. But I was like, I didn't get all the detail that you'll get in like Lord of the Rings, where on the flip side, I'm like, there's too much detail, you know? <laughs> like, I just, yeah. 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 I felt similarly to Kelly. I don't have a preference really. I know some people really like when there's build up in a story and some people really like when it kind of just throws you into the action. I don't have a specific preference in terms of either of those two setups, but I really felt like there was a lot of telling you what was happening instead of showing you what was happening. And that for me is a little patronizing to read as, especially as an adult reader, like you don't have to tell me, you can just show me and I can pick up on those like metaphors or, you know, the subtleties of what's going on in a conversation. It doesn't have to always be kind of like, and the, this person said this and they're a bad person or something, you know, like, I don't think it has to be so in your face. And that really got me through, well, through the whole thing. But especially in the beginning, it was really hard to get used to that. See, I didn't have that um, experience at all. And I actually made a note to myself that I, I thought the author was really skilled at anticipating questions that I would have as I go along. Um, because I think there were maybe not so many details as there could have been at the start. Um, but I think it would have been even more confusing for me if there had been way more details. Mm -hmm. And so I found that every time she introduced a new idea and I started to think, well, then wait a minute, what does that mean in terms of this? And then the next paragraph would be like, so you see it's because of this. And then I'd be like, ah, got it. So I guess it didn't bother me as much that she was telling me things because I felt like I needed to know to really kind of like allow myself to sink into the world at the very start. So I guess it just worked for me where it maybe didn't work for you guys. And I think that's, you know, that's the differences in people's reading styles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fair. Yeah, I like multiple perspectives. I didn't think that we needed all of the perspectives we had in the book. Um, I didn't find it confusing. I just felt like there were certain chapters where I was like, I don't think that needed to be a chapter, but okay. And with the epilogue, there was 86 chapters. 86! I'm like, oh my god! Which, I mean, the book itself, it was a big book, but it wasn't like the longest book I've ever read. I just no, felt, they were short chapters. Yes, they were short chapters, which I like short chapters in any book because I Me feel too. like, ooh, I'm accomplishing things, you know? <laughs> But I, 
there were some chapters where I was like, I don't know why this was a chapter. I don't know why we need your perspective on this. So I just felt there was a lot of repetition as well, like repetition in dialogue, repetition in you'd have a chapter, something would happen, and then they'd go to another person's perspective, and the same thing would happen again, but through their perspective. And I was like, what did we add to the conversation, though? Mm. You mm. know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. From that, do you guys have any book recommendations? I'm going to say right off the top that I do not have any book recommendations for this <laughs> book. If you like this book, read this book kind of thing. I don't have any of those. I have three. Great. So... Is it okay that I have three? Yeah. Because I can also Please, just do. you can give one for each of us. <laughs> Great. So I actually have three incredible book recommendations. All of them are also written by women of color. And I do find there that is kind of a unifying thread. And there's a lot of similar themes explored, which makes sense because of similar lived experiences. So um, my first recommendation is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. This is one of my all-time favorite books, and it very much felt like the adult fantasy version of this book. Um, there was a lot of similar elements in the fifth season, including an oppressed group of people who possess latent powerful abilities, a war-ravaged land, alternating perspectives, awakened rage, systemic racism, and more. So if you liked Children of Blood and Bone and are looking for maybe a more grown-up version, I would highly, highly recommend the fifth season and the whole Broken Earth series. They pretty much just changed my life. So I think I might pick that up. Yeah, me too. I'll just, lend it to you. Yeah, just cool. based on like what I was saying earlier about how I felt like there was something in there that I really wanted to learn about, but it just the book was not delivering that to me. Yeah, so maybe same. having and the author, a more adult version of that would help me get what I need from it. Mm -hmm. And that author, N.K. Jemisin, is the only author to have received a Hugo Award, which is a big sci-fi literature award, three years running, okay. and it was for each of the books in that series. No, nice. oh, She sounds so. familiar. I feel like I've heard that name before. Oh, cool. God, she had a I book come I just... out pretty recently. <laughs> yeah, she did. Um, on to the second recommendation. Um, so this is a sci-fi novella called Binti by Nady Okorafor. Um, so it is more sci-fi, but it is also set in a fictional, kind of futuristic African-inspired planet. It deals with overcoming prejudice and preconceived biases about different races. Also has a female protagonist with magical kind of mathematical abilities. Mm. Um, that one is a novella, so it's quite a lot shorter. It's almost like a short story. Um, but it does have a second and a third book, too, I believe. And they're all just really great. Um, and then <laughs> my third recommendation <laughs> is Brown Girl in the Ring by Nalo Hopkinson. This is a sci-fi fantasy novel that incorporates classism and traditional beliefs versus capitalistic ideals. It also has a female protagonist who has a connection to ancient deities and can conjure spirits which is quite a similar connection with Children of Blood and Bone. And I read Brown Girl in the Ring years ago, and I still think about it all the time. So it, it's a fabulous book. Thanks, Tilly. Yeah, thank you, Tilly. No prob. Happy to spread the love of <laughs> great books. Yeah. From that, we're going to get into our spoiler section. So if you haven't read this book and you're interested in reading it, please leave this podcast. You can go and rate us and give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you're enjoying it. We would really appreciate it. And if you have read this book, get ready for a synopsis that we're going to throw at you so that we're all on the same page. All right, let's get down to it. This book is set in the fictional kingdom of Orisha, which is inspired by West Africa. In this world, there are those known as diviners or people with the ability to do magic, but 11 years ago, the cruel king Saran wiped out magic, and the majority of those who can wield it, in a brutal raid. Diviners are now treated as barely human by those in power in Orisha. And as we know from the summary, our protagonist Zaley is on a dangerous quest to bring back magic to Orisha after a series of violent events. She is awakened as a magi and tasked to find three sacred artifacts and perform a ritual before the centennial solstice, which I believe is only about 20 days away from the start of the book. Zaley is traveling with her brother Tsane and the runaway princess Amari, neither of whom have the ability to do magic. 
Amari's brother, the conflicted soldier prince Inan, is tracking them due to a mysterious magical connection that has been formed between him and Zaylee. Zaylee and her companions find the last of the artifacts, the Sunstone, in the desert city of Ibeji, but must participate in a life-or-death stadium tournament to claim it as their prize. Very stressful reading. And after successfully obtaining the Sunstone, Zaylee and her friends continue on into the jungle. Meanwhile, Inan discovers he is able to meet with Zaylee in a dreamscape created by his magic, and they interact warily. Inan catches up with Zaylee in the jungle, and they fight. Before one of them can win, Zane and Amari are kidnapped by masked figures, and Inan and Zaylee must join forces to go after them. The masked figures turn out to be a secret encampment of diviners, and Zaylee and her team join forces with them before the camp is discovered by soldiers and attacked. So a whole lot of other crazy stuff happens after that, <laughs> including growing feelings between Inan and Zaylee, and also between Zane and Amari, but it all culminates at the sacred ritual ground, where Zaylee and her friends face off against King Saran, Inan, and their soldiers. A battle ensues with significant deaths on both sides. Zaylee's father is murdered by the soldiers, and King Saran is killed by Amari. The book ends with a massive cliffhanger as Zaylee performs the ritual to bring magic back and seems to die in the process. She meets her mother in a dreamscape and is sent back to the land of the living. She wakes up and asks if the ritual worked, and the last thing we see is that Amari now has a white streak in her hair and the ability to do magic. That all sounds wow. very good when you say it like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That's because it was really good. Well, that's what I mean by, for me, it's, it read like an outline. I was like, I was excited to read the book by listen, or by hearing the synopsis. I was like, I am all in for this. Yeah. And then I read it, and I was like, what am I reading? This is not what I signed up for. So, where do we want to start? <laughs> Our feelings? Our spoiler-filled feelings? <laughs> okay. I always want to start with my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, personally, I thought a lot of the world building wasn't very original. Like, there were animals called cheetah nares, oh, yeah, I had a problem with that, too. <laughs> lion nares, And they were basically just, like, souped-up lions, cheetahs, and panthers. They had horns. But that, and they were like, what's bigger. wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But I just thought, okay, you're going to call an animal that looks like a cheetah, basically a cheetah. But so everything just else call is it a cheetah. Yeah. Like, why did I have a different name for it then? Like, it just, it wasn't like different enough for me. Like, it just, it just, I don't know. It just wasn't like imaginative enough for me. I just didn't, I don't know. And then yeah. I was like, what does it even look like? Cause it was just like, okay, they're riding on Nayla and she has horns but i was like where are the horns on the back somewhere but how are they sitting on it like it just it wasn't descriptive enough for me i looked up art of the, of cheetah nares like fan art or i don't know if it's like official art or something but a lot of them have like it's like a cheetah but it has kind of like gazelle horns coming off its head but you wouldn't know that <laughs> I, yeah. I had a very similar problem with that. I actually texted Kelly about this when I started reading the book the second time. And I was like, I totally forgot how much this bothered me. Yeah, I, I had that written down. I didn't have a problem with the names of the places being um, not original or something. They're all places in Nigeria, like Lagos and everything like that. They're all real places in our world, which I was totally fine with. But when it came to specifically the unimaginative world building language, it really took me out of the story. So here's my thought. I didn't find it unimaginative because I read it as a futuristic version of Nigeria. So I kind of read it as if it was a sci-fi fantasy future world where there are these giant panther creatures that have evolved from actual panthers oh well if she so, would have said something like that then it would have been yeah. probably fine but <laughs> well and maybe it's not true maybe it's just how i read it because i was so on board with everything that was happening yeah. that i was willing to kind of accept um the details that i was given i was so taken in by the 
image that I was conjuring in my own head. Yeah. So it actually didn't bother me that the word was similar because it allowed me to imagine better. Whereas if she had created a whole different word, then would have had to explain it, it would have lost it for me. I think mm. the way you explain yeah, it, and it I, makes it more makes more sense because I didn't picture it as a futuristic Nigeria. I thought it was like an alternate universe, like way in the past kind of stuff. So that makes more sense to me yeah. with what's written than what I experienced because I was like, to me it was like, okay, we're in a whole other world like Lord of the Rings. I keep bringing back Lord of the Rings. I don't know why. But it's like we're in a whole other world. <laughs> but there's certain things that are so similar to ours, but just slightly different. And I was like, okay, well, where's the fun in that, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I think, well, like Tilly said, she was so into what was happening that that stuff didn't bother her. Whereas Kelly and I were not into what was happening. So of course, we're going to be nitpicky about the little things because we weren't enjoying the big things. So how Mm -hmm. how can we even brush aside those other things that would be like minor bothers if we aren't even it's, okay with the larger scale. Totally. I, and I totally get that because I'm the exact same way when I dislike someone in real life. <laughs> and then it's like yeah. every little thing that they do pisses me off. Yeah. Even if it would be totally normal if someone else did the same thing. Yeah. So I, I, I absolutely get that. And I'm sad for you guys that you didn't have the same experience <laughs> that I did because it was so great. And I I wish you could, like, read it through my eyes because I loved it so much. <laughs> I wish I could, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I went in wanting to like it, which is why I'm so upset. Because if I had gone in being like, I'm going to hate this book, like, why would I even read it? You know what I mean? But I wanted to love it. And I was so disappointed. That's why I'm so, like, ugh. Yeah, definitely. If I would have thought I was going to also not like it the second time, I wouldn't have been like, let's read this book (laughs) for the podcast. Because why would I do that to you guys or myself? (laughs) Hey, like, I didn't say at the beginning, but I read seven other books during the time I read this one because I was having such a hard time getting through it. But I was like, I need to finish it because we need to talk about it. And I do have things to talk about. So, but it was just so hard for me. And I have one note right here, page 181. So I'm not, I may be even a quarter of the way. I put random thoughts. I hate this book. I hate that so (laughs) far. (laughs) Everything has been so easy and predictable. For example, what should we do? Find the magic stone, the sunstone. Well, where is it? My magic thinks it's in this place. They go there. First person they see says, gee, I wish I'd win the magic sunstone. Oh, what? It's in a tournament that's happening right now. Look, he's going to hold it up. I'm like, what? And then I wrote, how the fuck does their magic work? Because it wasn't really explained until they saw the murals. And so you're seeing these pictures. But I'm like, what is Lacan's magic? What? What? Also, the names. Reaper. Oh, she does stuff with dead people. Tider. Water. Like, it just, I was like, oh. Flames. Yeah, I was like, I wonder what that is. Like, that's what I mean. I just was like, where is the imagination? Tilly looks like she's bracing herself. Like, I'm sorry. She's so ready to to yell about this. I'm just like, I'm sorry. No, no, I just am like, I want to, I want to, I want to yell to the skies about my, my feelings about it too. Go for it. Go for it. (laughs) Well, I have the opposite problem in a lot of books where I'm just like angry when they make up a whole bunch of words that have nothing to do with anything. Sure. Because that's not how language works. Sure. Right? I think language is evolves to be connective. So you want to be able to know um, what what the the word is talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm not explaining this very well. No, it makes but sense. But I'm thinking about like Latin words, you can see the root. Yeah, sure. Um in English words. Yeah. And so I, that, that, it's just literally not a problem that I have about <laughs> the words being bothersome. Yeah. Um, as to what you were saying about how it was very easy and straightforward, I do understand what you mean. And I chalked that up to it being a YA novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe just like a little bit more uh, predictable in plot. But what I think it's really complicated on is themes and metaphors. I so the plot. That, but that's okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. We'll get into that okay. later, but that's okay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I think the plot, yeah, was it the strongest? Maybe not. But I think it reminded me of like a video game where everything that happens yeah. is going to be used. Yeah. And everything that comes up leads to something else, yeah. which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I know the two of you kind of prefer more plot driven books. Like I think there are kind of different kinds of readers who prefer different kinds of books. And I, is that correct to say that you guys are more interested in plot than you are in other things? I, I think I am more interested in plot, but if characters are done well, or like if I feel like I'm connecting to the characters, the plot doesn't bother me as much. Like I, I've read a lot of books and enjoyed them where I've been like, did anything really happen in that? No. But I had such a good time just like being with the characters that it was fine that there wasn't anything happening with the plot. But Mm. in this, what I found was hard is that there was a lot happening with the plot, but it was just all so predictable. And Mm. it's not like I needed them to have like a wrench thrown into every turn they they took, but a little a little more. Yeah, like it worked for it a little harder, maybe than yeah. Like, they literally got to that place, and they're like, oh, the sunstone that we're looking for? What is that? We see it right before us? Oh, how do we get it? Oh, like, I just was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can I, barely live my daily life with without coming into contact with some kind of roadblock in some way. <laughs> and these people just, like, save the whole fucking world in, like, five days by being like, yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. And I'm like, but there were a lot of roadblocks that were thrown their way, right? They got, like, kidnapped by these people, and they got, like, murdered and brought back to life. And then, you know, they had to kill all these other people, and so much blood was spilled. And I think a lot of it was just very, like, ruminative about spirits and deities and what it means to um, live a life that is so full of oppression and trauma. Yeah. That was probably going somewhere else, but um, <laughs> what? I don't know. What? I'm, just getting, I'm just getting riled up, <laughs> so I'm not, like, saying things properly. <laughs> no, no, I think that makes sense. I just yeah. feel like the execution wasn't there. That's where I'm like, I don't know, you know? But I'll go back to what I said before because I didn't want to get into spoilers when I was saying first impression stuff. How do you how did you both feel about Inan's chapters? Because I felt like a lot of them in the beginning were just repetitive. Like kill the girl, kill magic, make sure my dad doesn't find out that I have magic. It was very repetitive at the beginning. And I was like, do we need this? It felt very much like a road trip movie where it was like, Oh, we're on the road again. Oh, some zany character comes in, but let's go back to that other character who's trying to follow them. You know, like I, I didn't like his chapters at the beginning. It got a little better near the middle and the end because he had other things going on. But I was like, mm-hmm. do we need to hear kill the girl, kill magic every like three chapters, you know? Yeah, I agree that I felt that they were very repetitive, but I did find myself kind of waiting for his chapters to see what was going to happen because I felt like that plot point of him going after them and having that kind of war inside himself was a better plot point than the main plot of her trying to save, I don't know, the world, I guess, or bring magic back. I felt that more compelling for me. So I, I guess like I liked the idea of his character a lot. I don't I don't agree with like the execution a lot, but I did like his chapters in terms of like spurring along the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree that there was a lot of repetition in especially in his chapters, but he kept surprising me with his inner conflict. I kept thinking is he a good character or is he a bad character? Like is he telling the truth? Is he actually going to do something to change? And I think I was kind of um compelled to keep reading to figure out if my impression of him was going to be correct or not. Mm. So at the beginning, I was intrigued by him. I thought, okay, he's like this soldier crown prince. Okay, now he has these magical abilities. Where the hell did those come from? Don't know yet. I want to find out. Mm -hmm. And then I could tell that there was like this fascination with Zaylee and I thought there was going to be some like (laughs) romance. And so I was like, hell yeah, I want to see a romance. (laughs) But then as it went on, I thought, 
wait a minute, I don't like Inan because he says one thing, but he seems to mean another, mm -hmm. but it's all because he was basically brainwashed by his father into believing that he needed to put duty before self, right? He kept repeating duty before self. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the part where I, maybe I'm an idiot reading this book, but I realized like, oh my God, he, he literally the thing he carries around with him in his pocket is his father's pawn from like yeah. a, a pseudo chess game. And I was like, oh my God, he's his father's pawn. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mind blown. <laughs> but I do think that there was a lot happening in his chapters that maybe didn't need to be repeated every time. So I I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I think in the beginning, it was very repetitive, where I was like, why, yeah. you know, but I agree, like, when it went further, he had more things going on. So I was like, okay, that's fine, you know, because <laughs> I like multiple perspectives. But I was like, why are we repeating, you know? But you brought up yeah. the romance. Let's get into the romance because I hated... Both romances. <sighs> okay, let me start with Anon. I was annoyed that they both kind of like yeah. blossomed at the same time because yeah. I was like, what, am, what? Is this just like a festival of sex? Like what's going on here? Honestly. Why are they all suddenly all having these feelings all the time? Yeah. The romances were like, okay. I I wasn't super invested in no. them. Yeah, I believed uh, definitely a lot more in um, Zane and Amari's romance. Just I because thought, they yeah, were I thought actually Amari spending was gay. time together. Yeah, true. What? I thought she was gay. You thought she was gay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, she's totally in love with Binta. Oh. Like, I wondered that as well a couple times. Yeah. Maybe she was. Maybe. Maybe she's I don't know. queer, you know? But I, def I definitely right. believed more in her and Zane's romance just because they were actually spending time together they were going on this journey they were seeing each other evolve and you know take on all of these um different challenges and stuff and grow as people whereas mm -hmm. like i can i can get behind a really good haters to lovers enemies to lovers trope yes. yeah. but there has to be some like evolving in between the hate and the love it can't be like hate and then love and I just, I felt I like it that can. was, it was just too unbelievable. The part where they were in that, like, dreamscape meadow place, which I loved that idea because I know that's a thing in African folklore. <laughs> Sorry. What? <laughs> There's just that, like, those scenes in Twilight where they're laying in the meadow. <laughs> just made me think of that. Oh. <laughs> I thought of Black Panther with his dad. I did too. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I love this, you know? Like, I really liked that. I thought, okay, cool. But what I didn't like was <laughs> the one part where Zaylee and Anon are in that dreamscape place, and suddenly she takes her top off and goes swimming. And he's like, I didn't want to stare, but ooh, ooh. And she's like, what, are you shy? Don't want to get in the water? Like, basically. And I was like, girl, two sentences ago, you're like, I'm going to gut you like a fish. And then you're like, ah take my top off like are you serious like are you serious well I, I do think there's maybe some cultural differences going on there where maybe there isn't as much body shame around uh nakedness and nudity but i do agree it was a bit jarring i the um, flirtation in that moment. of it because i i can understand if people are they have different feelings about nudity, but it was the flirtation of it all where I was like, where is this coming from? You know, <laughs> like I also just like, I mean, I'm not, I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't identify with cultures that are represented through this book, but if I fucking hated someone's guts, I would not strip down in front of them. No matter how no. comfortable I was with my body, I'd be like, I'll keep my top on. Thanks. Unless I was about to kill you and it was a distraction where I was like, look at oh, yeah. this. Ooh, ooh, and then uh, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to talk about Inan and Zaley because I have complicated feelings about it. Okay. So I do think that it is not a love story. It's not mm. a romance. I think it's an infatuation and a realization that the person that you thought someone was isn't that person in i'm and, and i'll explain a bit more once i get my thoughts together here but i basically thought that it was kind of an enemies to lover situation that i could kind of get behind because the reason they were enemies is not was not personal it was 
society. It was the way that both of them were brought up, right? Zaley was brought up thinking the nobility is bad because of the traumatic experiences that she went through with them basically eradicating all the magi and the people who wield magic, who also happened to be the more kind of um, middle to lower class people in that world. So it was set up so that there was like the nobility and then there was the people who could wield magic. And so there is this class struggle that we see throughout the whole book. And Inan is brought up within the heart of the monarchy, not in the lap of luxury because his father is a cruel, difficult man. Mm -hmm. And so he's brought up learning he has to fight for himself, he has to fight for his kingdom, and he's told all these lies about magic. But as it goes on, and Inan kind of observes Zaley and has this connection that is basically forced by the gods, um, he starts to see that maybe the prejudice that I carried in me all my life is wrong. And I was really interested in that story of unlearning prejudice, because I think they both had those instances together. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think it worked in the end because Inan made all the wrong choices. Mm -hmm. And so while I had been reading him all along as this person who was trying to do good, but couldn't break out of the mold that he was born into, I did get frustrated with him at the end because he kept saying all these things and convincing himself that he was a good person and then doing nothing. And then I think at the end he died. I'm not really sure how it <laughs> went down there, but we didn't get any more narrative from him after um, Zaley, I think, sees him stabbed. And then I was kind of left with this feeling of like, who is Inan? And he just felt like a culmination of all these ideas and not so much as a character. So I don't know. I, 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 I had so many feelings and then they were all kind of imploded and everything got me mixed up and it went in ways I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. But I liked it. I think their relationship would have done a lot better being maybe enemies to friends or allies. Mm. Yeah. Just because I think even though this is not a love story, if you're going to pick a trope like enemies to lovers especially, you need to flush it out so that it really holds up in court. You know what I mean? Like it needs to, there needs to be some kind of like active substance behind it and mm -hmm. i feel like that just wasn't there for me i would have much rather liked to see them come together and be like an alliance a really strong alliance where they can work together against his father and all you know i think that would have just opened up a lot of doors and yeah with his character i agree i feel like it was kind of a culmination of a lot of ideas and I think musical reference for a second, Aaron Burr in <laughs> Hamilton, he's a character that says a lot and doesn't do very much, mm -hmm. which is how most people are in their life. A lot of people are really willing to talk but not put their money where their mouth is with a lot of issues. So I think that's fair that you can have a character like that. But I think if that's what the intention of his character was, that wasn't brought across very well. And there should have been a little bit more development or a lot more development making that part of his personality or his struggle with being like, I want to do this, but I don't feel like I can. But really, it was just kind of like, I want to do this, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. There was no kind of justification behind why he wasn't stepping up and being this leader or trying to change the tide of what was going on yeah yeah it was very internal one thing i actually enjoyed in this book was the part near the beginning where amari was talking about how her mother the queen didn't really love her or show love towards her as much as her brother or other people in the court because the fact that her skin color was darker than her brother's and everyone else's. So I did not like the fact that she was discriminated against, but I liked that the author chose to highlight a real problem in the world that is colorism and discriminating against people in your own uh, cultural or ethnic group because they look different than you. So I thought that was a really good point to bring up, and it was really sad to hear this daughter talk about her mom 
and how she's not really, she doesn't feel love from her. So I did like that part, even though I didn't really enjoy most parts. I really enjoyed that part of like seeing that perspective from her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of in parallel to that, I was highlighting a whole lot of instances where they talked about Zaylee's hair changing texture once her magic was awakened and how she had um, she had, had white hair like all the diviners do. They have dark skin and white hair and I think silvery eyes as well, but that her white hair was straight and it hung in sheets across her back. But then once her magic was awakened and she became a magi, her hair became coiled and curly and how that was just such a beautiful moment of like curly natural hair is magical literally in this book and it just it made me so happy it was just so lovely to see her embracing her kind of like more curly hair and I I loved that part (laughs) yeah I really enjoyed those moments as well it was really nice to read about those things from somebody who experiences what it's like to have a battle with should I have my natural hair or should I try to make my hair look like the white standard and things like that? So it was really nice to see that. And I kind of wish that it was just built upon a little bit more. And maybe there were Mm. some deeper discussions about that. I understand because it was a YA book, maybe why those things weren't talked about maybe in a little bit more depth, but I would have enjoyed that personally. But also, Mm -hmm. if they're billing the book or marketing the book as like, this book is super dark and it deals with intense themes, then delve into it deeper. Because I think that was one of my issues with it, is I was like, okay, I get what you're trying to do in this book, but it didn't go far enough for me. I don't need, Mm -hmm. like, some gratuitous, like, torturous book about, you know, everything that is terrible and wrong with the world. But if you're going to talk about certain issues just go for it i think like if you want to highlight one very important issue that's important to you and that you have lived then go in so i can really understand like one book that i just read that i think did it beautifully and i mean she was an amazing author was tony morrison's the bluest eye that was gut-wrenching and heartbreaking and a totally different genre i get that But there was nothing in my mind that thought, like, I wish she had delved deeper. Like, it was like, whoa, you know? And I left, Mm -hmm. I I finished the book, and I was like, I have a lot to think about and a lot to process. And I have so many questions and things I want to learn. And But I didn't get that with this book. And again, I know it's a different genre, different audience. But, like, if you're going to build it as a dark, intense fantasy, I didn't think it was dark or intense. Really? There yeah. was so much violence. I thought that was pretty dark and intense. I found the violence cartoonish almost. And yeah. not, not that it was bad. It's just I didn't think it was dark at all. No, mm. I I read it and I was through all of the parts that were more violent or darker. I was just kind of like, yeah, okay. And that's fine. That's what's happening. I wasn't really hit hard by any of those moments. I would have really liked with the moments that, was, that we're talking more specifically about like, culture the colorism and stuff to really get in there what you said earlier nikki in this episode about how you felt like she was telling you a lot of things and not showing you that's why i felt with these issues because it was like okay we've got two different um cultures living in the same area and there's oppression and there's battles going on okay we understand how it works but it didn't delve deeper into the issues. It was just like, it's like how to make a pie. Here's the ingredients. I made a pie. It's like, but did you make a pie? I didn't smell a pie. I didn't taste the pie. I didn't see a pie. Like, (laughs) I don't know. I didn't think it was that. It wasn't quite that bad. Clearly she made a pie, but (laughs) you know, I just, (laughs) did that make any sense? (laughs) I do, I do take your points and I think they're, I think there are good points about wishing that there was more detail and more kind of deeper conversation. Um, But for myself, I was willing to go along with the book as it currently was because it's her debut novel. Mm. And so she still is quite a young author who's figuring her style and her ways of talking and showing things. She's still figuring that out. And so... I, for one, found it to be a very compelling and original debut novel. And I guess 
I kind of was okay with there being not as much detail because of that fact. I also think it, it might be a lot of pressure to have one book that like fulfills all of the the conversations and the details that that you guys are looking for. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's fair. I don't know. I think that's totally fair. And I also think, especially because, I mean, women are hard on themselves. We're hard on other women. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, unfortunately, we are. And I hate that. I hate that society has done that to us. <laughs> I also think, you know, as much as I myself am saying, I wish she had gone deeper into these topics about racism and oppression. It's also not her job to educate me. You know what I mean? Right. Even though I know this is a fantasy book. So I'm more talking about, I just wish the actual tone or style was more detailed. I know this is not a book educating readers like me about racism, but I think it was just me overall being like, I want more detail. But I yeah, think I that's a good point. I agree, yeah, because it's it's not that I'm looking for somebody to be like, these are all of the things that black people <laughs> struggle with, but because I think it, it is really important to acknowledge that it is her debut novel, but I guess because I read it quite a while after it came out, and there was mm. so much hype, people were yes. loving it, it spent so long in the New York Times bestseller list, I had the bar set really high. Because Same. that's what people were presenting to me. This is one of the best books they'd ever read. Everybody in America was loving it. All of this stuff. There was so much hype to bring this book up to like a top tier standard. And then mm -hmm. to have that kind of fall flat, I, I was putting a lot of pressure on it because that's what people were presenting me with. That being mm -hmm. said... I think in terms of the detail, and maybe this is it is discussed more in the next two books, like Tilly was saying, you know, it's a trilogy. Not everything is going to be brought up in the first book. Mm -hmm. But I feel like she set up a lot of stuff and then just kind of left it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there what I think I would have appreciated some more like tidbits of things like throughout to keep those those ideas going into the second book because I was really interested in while it's it's not a book to educate white people about racism or colorism and oppression that is what the book is about it's yeah. about mm -hmm. a group of people being oppressed for their differences to people that feel they are superior to them because of their differences mm -hmm. so I think I would have just appreciated a little bit more kind of real talk about that and and i would have appreciated that maybe over some of the more like action packed segments that didn't really hit for me yeah i think even like thinking of this book as if it were because i'm an actor i'm like reading it and some of the things i'm like picturing as if i was watching a performance and I'm like, okay, there's some terrible mm. things happening. Like, she saw her mother die. She witnesses her father be killed, right, right, or is killed right in front of her. But I just felt the way it was written, it was just, like, glossing over the trauma and horror. So that's what I mean with, like, detail. And also, one thing I would have loved more detail about was at the very end when Rowan and his little fleet of mercenaries goes and takes down the armada. And she's like, how are you going to, like, mm -hmm. do this without killing anybody? And he's like, huh, don't worry, I got it. And then two seconds later, you see everyone on the other boats are, like, tied up. And I'm like, how did that happen? I don't believe that you suddenly got all these people out onto other boats. And it was like, burp, 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 we fixed it. Like, <laughs> it was like Scooby-Doo. I know. And it, it was. And it was almost like there were three or four separate yes. endings. Like, there were parts in the book where I thought, oh, this has got to be the end. Like, this, you know, we, we've wrapped we've wrapped up this plot point, and then more stuff kept mm -hmm. happening. So I almost wonder if it could have been a couple of books and maybe have fleshed out kind of the second half yes. of it. Because I thought the first half, there was so much set up for the plot and for, you know, the, the hero's journey that they're about to embark on. And then there was a lot of waffling around in the middle about people's feelings, which I love reading about because I love reading about how different people think about uh, feelings and emotions. So I was into that, but I understand that it's not very interesting <laughs> for everyone. Um, 
And then I thought at the very end when, when Rowan kind of became this like cool pirate who also was like telling her maybe she could talk to someone for her mental health. And I was like, wait a minute, do I love <laughs> Rowan? Um, I wasn't expecting that. And also, where did he come from and why is he only here in the third, the third quarter mm, of the book? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even remember him being in the book earlier because this is how like hard it was for me to get through this book so when he came back at the end i had to google him and be like who the hell is he because i wrote a note saying like why would you introduce a new character in chapter 70 out of 86 i was like who the hell is this guy <laughs> and then i was like oh he was there near the beginning or not the beginning but like in the middle because i think tilly i think you've cracked my code because i think if this book had been <laughs> two books and just yeah. like more detailed yeah. in the first book and the second book, I probably would have enjoyed it more because I was like, there's way too much shit going on without any detail for me. I'm sorry, listeners. I keep saying the word detail, but I was missing it. So someone's got to put it in because I was like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's kind of like the conversation that I was having with you guys during the Cruel Prince mm -hmm. episode where I kept wanting more detail, but you guys didn't <sighs> feel that same need yeah. to have more detail. So it's it's funny that we're coming back to this now where it's like, you know what, actually the detail didn't need to be there for me, but you guys were like, we yeah, needed the yeah. detail. So I wonder what it is that kind of makes us... Uh, experience those I things. was I literally know. just about to say the same thing like during the cruel <laughs> prince you were like this is yeah. like, pretty contrived and stuff and that's how I felt yeah. about this book it was like I'm a hypocrite what about <laughs> it it was too long for me yes. for it to be enjoyable in one book I just I felt like yeah it was just a, the never ending story yes and it so much it, it was exactly like what you said Tilly like I felt like there was it's a, there's an ending but there's still like a quarter of the book left. There's another ending. There's another ending. There's another ending. And I'm like, when is it finally just going to be over? And then yeah. I'm like, there's two other books coming. Mm -hmm. And well, and it ended on such a cliffhanger yeah. too. Yeah. So I really, I really felt like if it was two books and she could have just gotten a little bit deeper with what was actually happening. Or maybe changed up the action a little bit to suit having two books. It would have worked a lot more for me. Yeah, because we keep going back to Lord of the Rings this episode. I don't know why. Full disclosure, I've never read those books because I tried when I was a kid. And I was like, this shit's too dense for me. Except I was a kid, so I was like, I don't get it. And I closed it. <laughs> but I loved the movies. And this book is, or not this book, Lord of the Rings is a huge walk. Okay? They're walking to Mordor for three books we're not here to talk about lord of the rings but i'm just saying this book had a lot of traveling so and that's fine it's a quest you know that's not her fault it's a quest but i'm like yeah if you had made it two books and like thrown in some more action stuff along the way and like just made it more surprising for me because it felt very much like okay mm -hmm. step one we're here now we're gonna travel to this place that i don't know what it looks like where it is how far it, or how long it took them to get there but we're traveling you know it it so, really reminded me of the first percy jackson book percy jackson oh. and the lightning thief but percy jackson and the lightning thief is like 200 pages and it's a middle grade novel so uh -huh. there it's like kind of like they get a map and it's like step one, step two, step three, like checking off as they go. And they have some like little setbacks, but they're nothing like too bad. And then they yeah. like get on with things and everything happens like very quickly, mm -hmm. which that's pretty much what this book, the structure of it is. But for like 600 pages instead yeah. of 200. So there's a lot of time in between there to do God knows what between when you're really easily completing these tasks that you have to do to get to the end goal. Yeah, and didn't I say at the beginning of this episode that I was like, what age group is this for? Is this, like, young YA? Mm. So I'm glad you brought that up, Nikki, because... <laughs> I just thought about that right now. I was like, wow, I've read a book like this, and I was like, it's Percy Jackson. <laughs> you know, this was not anywhere near the same, but I always think of the Muppets when they're like, let's travel by map. Like, anytime it's a travel story. <laughs> like, I wish I could travel by map, you know? <laughs> Okay, I need to bring up Inan at the very end of the book, though, because Tilly, you said 
You thought maybe he died? I have no idea. I don't know if he died or not. I think Did he, he? I think he got. I think <gasps> he got murdered. I thought I think he just so. got hurt, but he was, like, left on the field. And I was like, this guy is so flaky. Because, like, first he's like, oh, I hate magic. And then he's like, oh, but I'm magic. I'm going to help you. And then he was like, nope, I'm going to help my dad. And then this whole thing on the battlefield. I was like, what the frig? Like, I hate you. I hate you, Anon. I hate you. Yeah, I I also had um, similar feelings about Anon. I was really going back and oh, forth yeah. with him. I was willing to believe in him. And then he just, he kept disappointing me at every turn. Yeah. And then at the end, I, I do think he died just because we saw more chapters from Zaley's perspective and we saw more chapters from Amari's perspective, mm. but we didn't hear a single other thing about it. That could be another cliffhanger, though. And so I or think like, yeah, it I could be. Know. It could be, yeah. I think to me it felt like the logical resolution of his storyline, mm. um, which is that he was kind of doomed to want to do the right thing, but to choose the wrong um, paths. And the fact that Amari at the end had the white streak in her hair and could do magic where he had the mm-hmm. white streak, I, it felt to me like the gods had chosen him to be the next ruler with some magical abilities so that he would have um, a connection to the magi. And then now that he's gone, now Amari has it and she's what? going to be the queen. That's what I took from the ending. Okay, I thought his dad, I thought King Saran had an affair with a magi. And that's why he mm. had a streak. But Amari didn't have one yet. I also wondered yeah. that. I wondered that as well. But um, when he had the streak, when it was first mentioned, he talked about it being new. And that it had just happened when he bumped into yeah. Zaley in the market. I just yes. thought it... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was like, I think the whole time just being like, maybe it's just like a regressive gene that showed up later in life. <laughs> like... Mm. I mean, maybe, and who knows? Yeah, because I thought, I thought that his his dad, the king, had an affair with a magi because he was like really weird with everything and like gross. So I was like, okay, what is your deal, dude? Um, so I thought maybe he had an affair and didn't want to be open to his kids about it or like let the kingdom know that. I mean, obviously, someone would know because children were born. But anyway, I thought there was an affair and that they're half magi or half orishan i guess orisha um and the fa- and why amari didn't have a streak in her hair i thought was because she hadn't been touched or marked by a magi yet but i'm like she also spent a lot of time with a- with zaley so how did it not spark her streak if that makes any sense <laughs> i still feel it's it's the gods <laughs> but that's that's just my read on it we don't know because it yeah. was a cliffhanger so I'll read the second book. I'll let you guys know. <laughs> yeah, I won't. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really interesting, Kelly, that you went to the dad having an affair because when you said that, I was like, obviously it was the mom who had an affair because she'd have the kid and who would know? Oh, wow. Kelly, how does, uh, how do children work? How do babies work? <laughs> <laughs> what? I think the dad did. Nikki, I, well, maybe the right. dad did, and the mom went, and their mom went along with it. I don't know, but I was just like immediately like, no, the mom did it. I'm so oh. invested in that storyline, even though it's not even real. <laughs> you can write your own fanfic. About or it. <laughs> maybe, maybe Inan is from uh, an affair, and Amari isn't, and. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Because I'm like, that's why the queen hates her. I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Never mind. I don't friggin' know. This book did a number on me. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so confused. So we're going to start to kind of wrap up the episode here because we've talked about a lot of stuff. Kelly, do you want to talk about your favorite moment in the book? Yes. So my favorite moment, other than it being done, sorry, not sorry, Um, <laughs> just keeping it real. <laughs> This took me three weeks to read, okay? Um, my absolute favorite part, and I'm not being... Um, facetious. Uh, yes, I was like, is that the right word? I'm not being facetious here. I actually really loved the part at... Uh, it was chapter 83, the end of chapter 83. So almost at the very end of the book, again, not being facetious, um, Amari kills her dad on the battlefield, and he is, like, shocked because, like, he he's so rude to his children but he is really rude to amari and thinks that she's just like weak and spineless and 
you know, whatever. So she kills him. And as she is killing him and staring into his eyes, she says, do not worry. I whisper as he takes his last breath. I will make a far better queen. And I was like, whoo, mic drop. Here we go. Like, oh, you don't think I can do things? Don't worry. I'll be better than you were. You know, like, oh, I liked that part. Yeah. I love women getting revenge. I don't, I do not condone murder or patricide but i i do love a good revenge story so i was like get it girl get it i think one of my favorite moments or just kind of my favorite parts i don't have a specific line but i really love the tenderness that zaylee had for her father that was really nice to me Mm -hmm. i felt like those moments where she talks about him or where the family is all together i really felt all of their kind of like family energy and that the the love that they had for each other because they'd been through so much and survived so many kind of trials and tribulations. So that was really nice for me. Also, when I listened to the audiobook, I really enjoyed the narrator's voice. I yeah. thought that was really nice. Yeah. I actually had that as a note too. I thought she helped me finish the book in many ways, more than one, but I thought she did a really good job of performing the book and not just reading the words it wasn't like a standard audiobook where you know everybody kind of reads everything in the same way Mm -hmm. and they they say the the dialogue in this way that nobody would actually ever talk yeah she did a really good job at being real and very present with the words which was amazing yeah and i will say one other thing i loved about the narrator is I kind of wish I had started just with the audiobook, even though it was a very, very long audiobook. I really enjoyed listening to the narrator because I don't have much context for what the language sounds like in real life. So hearing someone who uh, is probably fluent in that language, she was reading it and it was just nice for me to hear the rhythm and the tone of like, how you would say these words because there were a few sentences in another language where i had no reference point just because i personally did not have a reference point for that so i was like trying to figure it out reading it but i liked hearing it it just made the experience of the book better for me yeah yeah and the narrator's name is bonnie turpin yeah she did so yeah she i loved it it was one of the most enjoyable parts was just listening to her talk when i was reading it the first time the, the only time, I guess, when I first read it, um, I would put it on before I went to bed, and I almost always just fell asleep very happily just listening to her voice. Yeah, get it, Bonnie. Good for you, girl. So one of my favorite parts of the book was actually at the very end, and it was the author's note. So I'm just going to read you the beginning of the author's note because it was really, really powerful and struck a real chord for me about the way I'd kind of Um, been reading the book all along and it just it made it just made me like really emotional so this is what the author's note says i shed many tears before i wrote this book many tears as i revised it and even as it sits in your hands now i know that i will shed tears again although riding giant lion airs and performing sacred rituals might be in the realm of fantasy all the pain fear sorrow and loss in this book is real Children of Blood and Bone was written during a time where I kept turning on the news and seeing stories of unarmed black men, women, and children being shot by the police. I felt afraid and angry and helpless, but this book was the one thing that made me feel like I could do something about it. I told myself that if just one person could read it and have their hearts or minds changed, then I would have done something meaningful against a problem that often feels so much bigger than myself. Now this book exists and you are reading it. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. But if this story affected you in any way, all I ask is that you don't let it stop within the pages of this text. And then she goes on to name some specific uh, people who were killed by police in 2017, 2018. And it's it's just really, I don't know, I don't know how to express this, but I'm, I just really loved reading the author's mm-hmm. note. Yeah. I think it's really nice that she closed on that. I mean, just because we're white doesn't mean we don't know what's going on. Obviously, we don't feel it in the same way that people in the Black or African-American communities are feeling it. 
but it's still sad and people are people in the end and that pain I think everybody who's sympathetic is feeling it so -hmm. it's really nice that she closed on that and gave all those people the acknowledgement that they deserve and also the fact that she was like don't let it just stay within these pages because that's that's the other thing people are like oh that's so sad let me go back to my life it's like no 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 this is now a part of your story so get up and do something about it Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i didn't enjoy Mm -hmm. her book but i have nothing against her and i'm like yeah like this is a problem and you're not just going to read a book and be like great back to my life I hope not, you know? Oh my god, I follow her on Instagram, and she literally looks like the coolest fucking person I've ever seen, (laughs) and I just want to be her best friend. Every time she posts a picture, I'm like, yes, girl, yes. (laughs) (laughs) She just, like, her style's so good, her house looks so cool, her dogs are so awesome, and I'm just Ah! like, I love it. Just don't tell her you didn't like her book. (laughs) Yeah, we'll keep it on. Yeah, I was like, you can't be, you can't be that good friends with her, because you'll have to lie forever. Well, maybe I'll read the second book you and like love that book. one, and then it'll be, like, a redeeming feature maybe. in a friendship. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like in Anchorman, when he's like, Ron Burgundy, I don't like you, but god damn it, if I don't respect you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that author's note did make me feel emotional and upset, And I would like to read just one line from the book that made me feel happy and empowered and really great, which is uh, quite similar to the one, Kelly, that you read about Amari. (laughs) I really was feeling Amari in this book. And at one point she said to Zane, I am a princess, not a prop. Do not treat me any differently. My father is responsible for this pain. I will be the one to Mm -hmm. fix it. Love that. And I just wrote this note of like, hell yeah, Amari. And I think she will. I think she will go on to fix all of the pain and the trauma of her father's legacy. And I I just have all these high hopes for the second book to make Orisha into this like really amazing place. Cool. Listening to you talk about it makes me want to actually just read the second book. We'll see. <sighs> Great. Let's yeah, do it together. I'm sorry. I'm going to sit You'll motivate out, but let me, me know. to do it. <laughs> let me know how it goes. That's all good. <laughs> One thing I wanted to briefly mention is that um, this book is being made into a movie. Yes. How do you guys feel about I'll that? I'll see it. I think it'll be a fantastic movie because I think that a lot of the detail that you guys were missing uh-huh. from the book will be really amazingly visually represented. And they're going to have to cut it cut it down because you can't put all 500 oh. pages of that into a movie. <laughs> that might work better for me, but I also think I'd have to see it with you two because I'm just scared. I'm scared. <sighs> I don't know. I was so excited for this book. And that's what really, that's why I'm so ticked off because I was like, <laughs> I felt like, you know, that famous Tyra Banks meme, we are rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. <laughs> so I, felt, <laughs> I was like, I wanted to love this. It just wasn't your book. And there are books that I read that just aren't my book either. And I mean, that's yeah. just, that's yeah. just life. Yeah. And, that's and I mean, there's certain movies that I'm like, I'd rather read that. And then there's certain books where I'm like, I'd rather watch that. So maybe I would prefer the book. I don't know. Yeah. I hope yeah. that they do a good job on the movie, the movie. And I hope that there's like new actors getting mm. their big break, you know? Thanks for a really good discussion, guys. It was, yeah. It was good. I'm glad we can have these kinds of discussions and still be great friends. If you've read the book, what were your thoughts? Let us know. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Are you team Zaley and Anon? Are you team Amari and Zane? What are you feeling? Let us know. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the BYOB podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more from us, you can head over to our social media accounts to keep up to date on what book we'll be reading next. Stay tuned after this to hear the first line of our next read, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller which is a retelling of a classic Greek myth about a powerful demigod warrior. See you next time, and until then, keep on drinking in great stories. Cheers! Next time on BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book Podcast. My father was a king and the son of kings. (laughs) 